um, Dr. Yu Cheng Wang, the chairman of the academic committee of the Taiwan AMI Society, PAMIS. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to this exciting session of our ultimate master series, Endoplate Therapy Triology for AMI, the part one. And we are very fortunate today to be joined by a esteemed panel of experts who are going to share their knowledge and insights on this uh, critical topic. And uh, a warm welcome to uh, Professor Mark Popi, uh, Bonaka from the Uni University of Cor Coronado and our own Taiwanese expert, Professor Zhong Xianlin from Kaohsiung Medical University's University Memory Hospital. Uh, our, and, and we also have uh, two distinguished uh, uh, panel uh, panelists, Professor Chun Yao Huang and uh, Hong Yu Guo uh, from uh, Taipei University Hospital and Kaohsiung Veteran, uh, Veteran General Hospital uh, to, uh, for, to hosting the discussion sessions. And our objective today is to not just to learn, but to engage the insight, uh, insightful discussion, exchange ideas, and cont contribute to advancing our understanding of the role and status of the new generation P2Y12 inhibitors. And we, we also have a chance to, to have a more understanding about the TSOC guidelines for the high-risk prior, prior MI patients. And thank you for uh, joining us uh, uh, this morning. And uh, before we navigate through the, the sessions, I would have a short housekeeping uh, message to all of our audience. Uh,是不是请看下一张。好,那所以说,呃,针对我们的这个今天的这个session的教育积分的部分,那线上的这个听众的话,可能,呃,再麻烦你们先扫QR的扣先签到报道,然后以,就是以利后续的这个教育积分
and uh, he's a master in the public health in Harvard University. Uh, <clears throat> and after the company, company his training, he joined the faculty at the Brigham and the Women Hospital and the Harvard Medical School and become a uh, in in the uh, investigator of the TME study group. So he joined many TME uh, study. And in 2018, he joined as the faculty of University of Colorado uh, School of Medicine. So he, <coughs> he published a uh, lot of paper about the ACS and the uh, <coughs> and, and acute myocardial infarction. He research focus on ischemic risk in patient with the risk factor for uh, established as a score the vascular disease. So uh, I think Professor Bonaka is an excellent uh, speaker in this topic. So let's uh, welcome for Professor Bonaka's speech. Uh, Professor Bonaka, please, thank you. Thank you, and it's an honor to, to be here with all of you. I'm very much looking forward to it. I have a, a pre-recorded talk, I think, that will be played now, and then uh, I'll be listening to all of the sessions and look forward to a, a wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark Banaka, and I'm presenting to Cagrelor and High Risk Prior MI patients, a 10 year review. These are my disclosures. I'll begin with noting that dealing with dual antiplatelet therapy has actually gotten far more complicated. There have been several decades of research represented on this slide, and obviously this ends at 2020, 2021, and, and there are more studies at every conference. Uh, and the more we learn, the more questions that we have about how to tailor, how to utilize. Nonetheless, it's a question that persists in our clinical practice of how do we consider antithrombotic therapy in coronary patients, and today's focus will be on the high-risk prior MI patients. Now, it's useful to remember where we started, which was really stent protection. And this is one of those seminal studies which shows that in patients with first-generation stents, stent thrombosis was a big problem and that aspirin and warfarin weren't the answer. And it was really inhibition of the P2Y12 receptor that was critical in protecting coronaries and coronary stents from post-procedural complications. Nonetheless, although that, that really has framed our thinking around DAPT, the CURE trial is really what put it on the map for acute coronary syndromes as a class one indication for patients for at least a year. And as a reminder, CURE was over 12,000 patients with acute coronary syndrome that were mostly medically managed. Uh, and so these patients weren't about stent protection. It was high-risk patients preventing recurrent events. And you can see that the addition of clopidogrel to aspirin prevented recurrent acute coronary syndrome or, or, or recurrent MACE events within the first 30 days on the left, as well as uh, from 30 days and beyond. And this really framed that one year of DAPT after ACS with an open question of you know, who would benefit from longer treatment. Now, it makes sense that CURE showed that dual antiplatelet therapy would protect patients with coronary disease from recurrent events, and that those events are not particularly um, necessarily stent related, that as we know from the prospect study here, that when you have atherosclerosis as a systemic disease, and that recurrent events are as likely to derive from non-culprit lesions as they are from culprit lesions, and therefore you need systemic protection, not just stent protection, but protecting the other lesions may not look severe in angiography, but biologically they're dangerous. So CURE was a landmark trial. That was clopidogrel. Why not use that drug in everyone? Well, the reality is that while Clopidogrel looked pretty good in cure. It actually is a highly variable drug. You know, about one in three patients won't respond to clopidogrel or get the desired antiplatelet effect. And we know that's because it's a prodrug and different people metabolize it, in metabolize it in different ways. And in a population level, that looks good. But for the patient sitting across from you in clinic, you don't really know what that patient's going to get. Would make sense that we could test, although prospective trials looking at that strategy haven't really shown benefit. And the reality is that when we have more 
um, consistent drugs that particularly direct acting drugs, we tend to favor those. So we favor NOAX or DOAX to warfarin, right? They're very predictable. We don't have to measure INR. And in the same way, there are le later generation thionipiridines like prazagril and ticagrelor, te which is a direct acting PTY12 inhibitor, are preferable. They're potent, highly active, and less variable than clopidogrel. In fact, you can see here from the pharmacodynamics that there's faster onset, uh, that it's more potent than clopidogrel, and it's actually faster offset to all desirable characteristics that just make it a better drug in terms of its PK and PD. Now, the landmark trial that proved that a more potent, less variable P2Y12 inhibitor was better is the PLATO trial. And I know there have been small, underpowered, open label flawed trials that have tried to look at different comparisons, but this is an 18,000 patient trial and ticagrelor was superior to clopidogrel both in the first 30 days on the left, but even after 30 days. So if you're thinking about switching patients from ticagrelor to clopidogrel, on the right side of the slide, you're basically taking them off the yellow line and putting them on the blue line, which wouldn't be desirable for a patient. Obviously, you want to continue protection. And this protection matters. Uh, don't forget that in the PLATO trial, there was a 22% reduction in all-cause mortality over the course of the trial with ticagrelor versus clopidogrel because these are bad events and they're worthwhile to prevent them. Now, there was more bleeding. Timmy major non-cabbage bleeding was increased, although other forms of bleeding were not significantly increased. And when you see a reduction in all-cause mortality, uh, clearly the ischemic benefit outweighed the bleeding risk. And this benefit was consistent in those that were invasively managed on the left, but importantly, just like cure, those that were medically managed did better with the Cagler than clopidogrel. And so you can imagine if there was an aspirin only group, they'd be even higher than the clopidogrel line. Um, but now we've iterated, we've done even better with a more potent, less variable drug. It, I think it's an important reminder that although there's a lot of momentum to de-escalation, perhaps de-escalating with reducing aspirin is, is a reasonable thing to do based on twilight, but certainly P2Y12 inhibition is so important. We learned that from the, the early stent trials, and we see it here again, that when you de-escalate P2Y12, you expose patients to risk here about a five-fold increase in the hazard ratio of recurrent my, myocardial infarction in six months. So when we talk about the prior MI patient, really we're asking the question of, is there residual long-term risk? These are data from the Improve It trial. This trial was large, over 18,000 patients, all acute coronary syndrome. And there's two key things to take away from this slide. First of all, there is substantial risk in patients, and most of the risk is beyond one year. We think about the first year as the highest risk period because the curve is the steepest, but when you look at the events, the majority are going to occur after one year, and therefore they need continued protection. In this study, everyone had an LDL less than 70. Their lipids were exquisitely well controlled, yet there's high residual risk. The second lesson to take from this slide is the risk isn't the same in everyone. And what you can see on this slide is that in an ACS patient, if you add diabetes or polyvascular disease, their event rate goes from about 30% at seven years to 40%. You can see those two curves in the middle. When you add the two together, when you have two additional risk factors, you have somebody who has a very malignant atherothrombotic phenotype with an event rate of 60%. That's an extremely high event rate, and those are the patients that you should be most worried about. Now, Pegasus TIMI 54 was the prospective trial that showed patients with a prior MI with at least one additional risk factor had long-term risk. These are patients that were one to three years prior, but they were randomized, and uh, after three additional years, they had ongoing risk with no inflection point to show that that risk had gone away, and that actually the 90 milligram dose of ticagrelor used in the PLATO trial was efficacious at reducing that risk and actually a lower dose, two thirds of the exposure, one that was planned to be better tolerated, had about the same efficacy. And you can see here both highly statistically significant outcomes. It's interesting that the 60 milligram dose looked the same because when you look at the antiplatelet effect here in the blue for the 60 milligram or the red for the 90 milligram, everybody responds and they have a high degree of platelet inhibition. So 60 milligrams is enough for long-term secondary prevention. Now, what you can see in the trial at the bottom of this slide is that the 
days of follow up from randomization, but the natural history is actually quite different. So patients came into the trial about 1.7 years from their prior MI. When you look at the far right of this slide, recognize that this is following patients from 3.2 to 4.3 years at the beginning to about 5.3 years at the end. This is over five years from their index MI. The event rate is 3% per year, the same as the first year, and the hazard ratio for benefit is the same. There is no trend to decreasing risk or attenuation of benefit. This is a long-term prevention strategy. And again, it's not about stent protections. There was a large reduction in recurrent ST elevation myocardial infarction, as you can see on this slide, on the order of about 40%. There was also a statistically significant 25% reduction in the occurrence of strokes. And those strokes were the bad ones. When you look here, the difference between ticagalor and placebo, there was a 43% reduction, statistically significant, in strokes that were moderate to severely disabling or fatal, the worst kind of strokes. So systemic benefits for stroke, STEMI, and of course, stent protection, although the event rates for stent thrombosis uh, have gone down with better devices, there was still a clear benefit for stent thrombosis. And the broad benefits as we learn that thrombosis in these high risk polyvascular patients is not just arterial, but also venous. You can see here that there was a statistically significant 32% reduction in venous thromboembolism with ticagrelor, uh, along with the benefits for stroke and MI, so systemic protection. This also extends to PAD events, where you can see that there are reductions in acute limb ischemia or peripheral revascularizations. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, in those patients who actually had PAD, there was a 2.8% absolute risk reduction with ticagrelor. So there was a bleeding price to pay. There always is. There was higher with the 90 milligrams than the 60 milligrams, as you can see on this slide, but there was no excess in fatal bleeding or intracranial hemorrhage. What was the bleeding? Well, you can see it clearly on this slide. This was all gastrointestinal bleeding. Uh, we've seen this in other trials, such as in the COMPASS trial, that you know most of this are patients who have a problem in their GI tract, like a polyp or a cancer. They don't know it, and they get exposed to uh, more potent antithrombotic therapy, which unmasks those bleeding risks. There was no excess here in, in other kinds of bleeding, as you can see. And we'll get to why anemia is such a powerful tool to risk stratify, because this is all occult GI bleeds that are unmasked by adding a potent agent. Now, I mentioned the 60 milligram dose was just as efficacious as the 90 milligram dose, but because it was a lower dose, it was actually much better tolerated. And you can see here that patients were much less likely to discontinue the 60 milligram dose than the 90 milligram dose, both for dyspnea and bruising and other features. So it's really nice to use that 60 milligram dose when people cross the one year line because it's going to be better tolerated long term. Okay, so. Overall in Pegasus TIMI 54, this is what we got for the primary outcome. And you can see that that long-term treatment for three years would reduce 18 CV death or MI, uh, MI or stroke events at the cost of nine major bleeds, no excess in intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding. That's a two to one benefit risk ratio. And you might argue that's pretty good. Maybe I want to treat all of my prior MI patients like that. Or you might say, I really want to know who are the patients that weren't going to bleed and are going to derive the greatest ischemic risk. But figuring out who's going to bleed is challenging. These are uh, nice, uh, a nice figure from a, a publication circulation 2019. But you can see there's a lot on the slide that's challenging. Patients who are older, many of them are very high ischemic risk and still would have benefit from therapy. You don't want to deny people therapy because they're older. Same with renal disease. Those are patients who are high risk for both ischemic and bleeding events, and so you don't necessarily want to exclude them all. Certainly cancer and liver disease and other things are obvious as well as a bleeding diathesis or, or oral anticoagulation. But I think, you know, having more simple, simplistic ways of selecting patients may be beneficial. There are some like the precise DAP score, which make very nice algorithms and you can utilize them, but there are some elements of this like age and creatinine clearance which also alias for high ischemic risk and you don't want to deny people who are older important drugs just because they happen to be older it's complex when you look at the uh, different recommendations but obviously bleeding risk is something that we have to tackle if we're going to think about who to selecting 
for <clears throat> long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. So we looked at Pegasus TIMI-54 to see if there were simple characteristics that would help us to identify patients at higher bleeding risk. And we found two elements that predicted bleeding but did not predict ischemic risk. And that was a history of spontaneous bleeding leading to hospitalization or anemia at baseline. Remember, anemia tells you of the patient who's got occult blood loss in their GI tract who's more likely to bleed. And when you look on the right side of the slide, those patients who are at low bleeding risk, who didn't have either of those features, had less than half the increase in bleeding with decagrilor than those who are high bleeding risk, an absolute risk increase of 1% versus 2.2%. So very <clears throat> clear differentiation of who was going to bleed and who wasn't. And you can see an overall three-year event rate of 1.9% of, uh, versus 4%. Um, in the high bleeding risk patients. So these were very effective at selecting those high risk patients. Now, we looked actually at how this bleeding predictor scale, those two elements perform versus precise DAPT. And you can see on this slide, there's only one patient in Pegasus that would have been reclassified from low to moderate bleeding risk um, uh, using the precise DAPT score and only six that would have been low risk from very low risk. You can see that on the left side of the slide and neither of them bled. And the truth is these two predictors perform better than precise DAPT in Pegasus TEMI 54. What about ischemic risk? Well, you can see on this slide that we published a number of subgroups um, from this analysis. This is sort of a 10 year history of Pegasus. Each one of these, you can see the citations below, but <clears throat> patients with a more recent MI, multi-vessel disease, type 2 diabetes mellitus, peripheral artery disease, chronic kidney disease, multiple MIs. All of these features identify patients that are higher risk of ischemic events and derive a greater benefit from long-term tacagrelor. So we said, could we put this together in an algorithm? And here's step one. You can see that could we identify patients at high bleeding risk? I showed you that if they have either a low hemoglobin or prior hospitalization for bleeding, that was about 19% of patients. Those are the high bleeding risk ones. 81% of patients then are at low bleeding risk. And you can stratify them based on the risk factors. If there are zero to one risk factors, that was about 22%. And almost 60% had two or more risk factors listed here on the slide. All individual subgroups that were pre-specified or published of subgroup, as subgroups of interest. And when you look here at the slide, you see the results. On the left side of the slide, the 19% of patients who are high bleeding risk have very high event rate, and they don't benefit from long-term tacagrelor. And we can understand why, right? They're not gonna stay on the drug, they have bleeding issues. On the right side of the slide, those three groups of bars are the uh, low bleeding risk patients. And you can see by the number of risk factors, a gradient of benefit. Zero risk factors, they don't seem to benefit. One risk factor, they have a benefit, but it's more intermediate. And those who have two or more risk factors had a big benefit over a 20% relative risk reduction number needed to treat of 53. Now, this goes back to the improvement data I showed you. If you have two or more ischemic risk factors like diabetes and polyvascular disease, you have a very malignant atherothrombotic phenotype and you benefit from long-term tacagrelor. This is the high-risk prior my patient. When you look at cardiovascular death, you see exactly the same story. In fact, you see a little bit higher with tacagrelor because those in the ble high-risk bleeding patients. But when you look at the low bleeding risk patients with one, or if, uh, particularly those with two or more risk factors, a statistically significant reduction, uh, over 1% absolute risk reduction. You can see the data here, and importantly, all-cause mortality. And when you look at the low bleeding risk patients, and when you look by the number of risk factors at the far right, those patients with two or more ischemic risk factors that were low bleeding risk had a statistically significantly lower rate of uh, all-cause mortality. So is this a needle in the haystack? Are these patients rare? Well, this nice analysis from the Sweetheart Registry looked at over 100,000 patients and said, okay, how many of those patients are um, you know, low bleeding risk can have at least a two risk factors. And you can see here it was 53%. Remember in Pegasus, it was 59%. So this real world 
registry of over 100,000 patients gave us, us almost exactly the same answer, that the majority of patients, 50 to 60 percent, are going to be low bleeding risk and have at least two ischemic risk factors. These patients are in your clinic and they do benefit from prolonged um, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor. So here's a patient I saw in clinic, a uh, 56-year-old gentleman. He had had uh, no uh, bleeding. He'd had a STEMI 12 months prior. You can see he had sort of multi-vessel disease there. LDL is well controlled. He's got diabetes and PAD with cl claudication, so he's got at least two risk factors. And you can see his you know, drugs listed on the right. And so what is the benefit risk? Well, this is a patient who has definitely got high ischemic risk, he's got four risk factors. He'd had prior bruising, but it resolved, does construction work, but felt his bleeding risk was uh, acceptable. And importantly, did not have anemia, had never been hospitalized for bleeding. And so clearly our algorithm tells us this is a patient who benefits from long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, I do want to comment that there are other options out there, right? And the European guidelines give a class 2A to long-term rivaroxaban or to Cagrelor. And there's, you know, more data now for monotherapy of P2Y12 inhibition. You can see Pegasus, Compass, and Aspirin here. And so we've got a few options. The guidelines say that we really should consider um, uh, using a more potent strategy based on Compass and Pegasus. So we should do more for the patients that are not at high bleeding risk and are at high ischemic risk and showed you how to pick those. You know, this table is in the guidelines. It doesn't really give us a lot to go on in terms of which one to pick because the data all look similar and really the populations were quite different for the trials. I'll tell you, I don't think there's a bleeding advantage to any of these strategies. Here's gusto, moderate or severe bleeding, annualized rates and charisma and DAPT, the first two trials. That's with clopidogrel. <clears throat> as DAPT, you can see TRA2P, TIMI50, which was another drug called Vorpaxar, and then Pegasus, and then Compass, 1.1% um, increase over about two years. The take-home message from this slide is the bleeding risk. It looks exactly the same for all these trials. It's about a half a percent per year increase in gusto, moderate, or severe bleeding. So I don't think there's a safer option. I certainly don't think the data show that clopidogrel is safer than ticagrelor, although um, many people feel that way because it's less potent. The data just don't show that. Now, in the patient I talked about, <clears throat> PAD in the subgroup of Pegasus in the patient with him, PAD and prior MI, there was really a big reduction in MACE mortality and not a lot for bleeding. The number needed to treat was 20, so I think that was very favorable. And as I showed you before, there was a benefit for those major adverse limb events. And so he's already tolerating DAPT. This seems to be a good option for him. I'll also say that there are patients who are continuing on DAPT, just like him. They're on it, tolerating it, continuing on at the top part of the slide, had the greatest benefit of continuing on rather than restarting. So if this is a patient who came in on aspirin only, I probably wouldn't start ticagrelor if he was three or four years out from his MI. I'd probably start rivaroxaban. But for a patient who's you know at their one-year mark tolerating DAPT, these data show they do really well by continuing on long-term DAPT with ticagrelor and, and by going to the 60 milligram dose. Part of this is that actually the bleeding liability for these drugs goes down over time. This is the the difference in rates of bleeding with ticagrelor versus placebo over time. And you can see once you pass the one-year mark, those curves really narrow and you have much less of a bleeding risk to pay. Now, <clears throat> there are other data that support long-term use. I'll just mention the DEMIS trial, sorry, here. Uh, these are patients with diabetes and coronary disease, never had MI. But those who had real deal disease, history of PCI on the left and had tolerated P2Y12 inhibition had a clear net benefit. And this patient I'm talking about also has diabetes. So this is how I tend to think of it, that um, patients with symptomatic atherosclerosis, low bleeding risk, prior MI with at least two risk factors, or um, high risk coronary disease with prior PCI, if they've got coronary disease, they need P2Y12 inhibition. If they're on it and tolerating it, continue it on, and 60 milligrams of ticagrelor is a great option to reduce um, you know, the risk of bruising or bleeding. If they're CAD, PAD with high risk features, they're not on a P2Y12, or particularly for po PAD post revas patients, Voyager PAD patients, I think rivaroxaban is a great option. <clears throat> so just to give some summary and conclusions here, 
Patients with prior MI remain at long-term heightened risk of atherothrombosis. Antiplatelet therapy remains a cornerstone of atherothrombosis protection. Remember, even in Compass, the rivaroxaban only arm didn't show a significant benefit. Antiplatelet therapy is critical, and I'd say in particular P2Y12 inhibitor therapy. The more potent strategies reduce ischemic risk but increase bleeding. From Pegasus and other studies, we've learned that you can find these patients. You know, if, if you exclude patients with anemia or prior hospitalization for bleeding, they're going to be low bleeding risk. And if you <clears throat> stratify their ischemic risk factors and they have at least two, then they're going to benefit. The strategy of DAPT using 60 milligrams after one year reduces ischemic risk, but has broad benefits. And although it has an increase in bleeding, that there's a net benefit. The last thing I'll say is that when you use long-term DAPT, you always have the option of dropping aspirin and continuing the P2Y12 inhibitor. There are other strategies where you can't do that, but I think it's always nice to have the option to de-escalate, right? So a patient who's on aspirin and 90 milligrams of Ticagrel or tolerates it for a year, you can de-escalate by going to 60 milligrams of Ticagrel. If they have continued bleeding issues, you can drop the aspirin and continue the P2Y12. And that gives you a lot of flexibility as you personalize the antithrombotic protection of your patients and really follows the data. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to present in this wonderful symposium. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Professor Bonaka, the excellent speech uh, about the the uh, for the breathing risk patient. How should we uh, prescribe the anti uh, anti therapy? So, because we have a, a discussion uh, section uh, last, so we go on for the next uh, speech. So let's uh, <clears throat> let's introduce the next uh, moderator. Uh, uh, Dr. Wang Yuchen. Wang Yuchen is a uh, 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 chairman of the uh, uh, scientist board in ta Taiwan Myocardial Infarction Society. He is also a uh, uh, director of the internal Department of Internal Medicine in Asia uh, Hospital. Uh, Professor Wang, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Wang. And next, I'm honored to introduce introduce Professor uh, Zhong Shen Lin. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, figure in the field of cardiology and uh, dedicated uh, academic uh, physicians. And Professor Lin is currently served as a professor in the Department of the Internal Medicine at Gaoshou Medical University and as the chief of the cardiology division at uh, Gaoshou Medical University Hospital. And Professor Lin uh, uh, was graduated uh, at Gaoshou Medical College and get uh, uh, his um, MD degrees. Then he he, uh, he required his master and the PhD degree from the uh, the Graduate Institute of uh, Clinical Medicine at Gaoshou Medical University. And Professor Lin has uh, held uh, significant positions within various uh, various medical societies in Taiwan. Uh, he's part of uh, the executive teams of the Taiwan Society of Cardiology, Taiwan Hypertension uh, Society, and, uh, and the Taiwan Society of, uh, of Lipid and Other Sclerosis. In, in addition, uh, uh, Professor Lin also served as a deputy editor-in-chief of, of the uh, ECTA Cardiologica uh, uh, Sinica, uh, the, the, the journal of the Taiwan Society of Cardiology. Uh, besides, the Professor Lin is impressive to have a, a, a great uh, contributions to the scientific li li uh, literatures, uh, he, including the uh, 285 uh, SCI papers and the 53 papers presented at the scientific meetings. So he's not just a renowned uh, uh, physician, but also a dedicated researcher. And today, uh, the topic for uh, Professor, Professor Lin will share is current, current standing of TSOC guideline for uh, high-risk prior MI uh, patients. And uh, we are privileged to have him with us today, sharing his experience and insights. Please join me uh, in welcoming, in welcoming uh, Professor Zhong Xian Lin. Professor Lin, uh, please. Thank you for Professor uh, Wang's kind introduction. Uh, dear Professor Bonanka, uh, President, and uh, my dear colleagues, today my uh, topic will focus on current uh, standing of uh, Taiwan Society of Cardiology guideline for high-risk 
a post myocardial infarction uh, patient below is my uh, uh, conflict of interest. So uh, we published the uh, CCS guideline uh, this year and focused on how to improve the patient's care in chronic, uh, coronary uh, syndrome patient. Today, I will focus on the uh, anti uh, bladder anticoagulation therapy after uh, one year for uh, uh, my uh, patient. So overall, there are three recommendations. The first one is uh, a lifelong uh, aspirin use uh, for all the uh, CCS patients if no contraindication. The second one is a class 2A uh, label B indication uh, for patients uh, suffer from uh, acute myocardial infarction after one year and uh, less than uh, uh, 30, uh, six months. Uh, and the patient can receive uh, Decaguil uh, 60 uh, milligram if they are high thrombotic risk and the low uh, breathing risk. And the, also the uh, recommendation for uh, 2BB level evidence B uh, for patient uh, with uh, chronic coronary syndrome and uh, also uh, low uh, breathing risk and high thrombotic risk. Uh, physician can add a rivastatin uh, 2.5 milligram twice per day for patient. Uh, if we uh, just focus on uh, TSOC guideline, that's all. So today I will uh, uh, summary uh, the reason uh, guideline a recommendation for patient uh, after one year of myocardial infarction. Let, let me begin from the uh, 2007 and 2019 and also uh, the ESC paper published in uh, 2021 and the, uh, our uh, society uh, guideline for anti-thrombotic uh, therapy uh, in 2021. And finally, uh, the 2023 guideline for a lost kind of patient. Let's back to uh, 2017. After uh, one year's uh, acute coronary syndrome, you can see uh, for those with uh, acute coronary syndrome patient, the recommendation is aspirin plus ticagrelia, prasugrelia, or uh, clopidogrelia. That's based on the DAPT trial and the Pegasus trial. But if a patient with uh, uh, chronic coronary syndrome, after one year, uh, the recommendation also, uh, the guideline also recommendation aspirin plus uh, clopidogrelia. That's major based on the uh, DAPT trial. So back to the uh, charisma try, a patient uh, uh, 45 years older and they have uh, additional risk factor, including some have established ASCA and the others with uh, risk factor only. This is the uh, final uh, try for the chloropidoglia, just focused on high risk group. And uh, as you know, uh, the data is uh, neutral uh, for uh, those with risk factor only and the uh, ASCA patient it on a uh, uh, chloropidogrelia did not improve the outcome. However, if we uh, stratify patient uh, into those with ASCA, so-called documented cardiovascular disease, and the risk, fa risk factor only, uh, you can find uh, uh, analysis, those with uh, established ASCA patient may be uh, benefit from the uh, chloropidogrelia. Uh, it on. So if we uh, further uh, uh, analyze those who is, uh, uh, have ever suffered from myocardial infarction, you can see it on clopidogrel can provide a uh, 17 uh, percentage uh, mass rate reduction. And for uh, among uh, these different uh, outcome, a uh, patient had uh, prior MI, prior ischemia stroke uh, can benefit more. So for those who have ever suffered from uh, myocardial infarction, the subgroup and this is found, uh, clopidogrel and can provide a more cardiovascular benefit. However, uh, the patient uh, may have suffered from uh, Glasgow uh, moderate breathing in the overall the population. And for those with documented ASCA population, also uh, increase the uh, Glasgow moderate breathing. So that's the price we should pay uh, if we want to 
uh, get a uh, better uh, cardiovascular outcome for those with documented atherosclerotic uh, population. After a charisma, charisma study, uh, the uh, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy for uh, CCS patient, uh, uh, the issue uh, uh, re initiated uh, uh, from the uh, ESC 2006. That's because uh, when we use more uh, first generation drug inducing stent, we found the patient has suffered from uh, stent thrombosis. So after the uh, issue uh, flare up, uh, many uh, clinical try try to prolong use the uh, DAPT to try to reduce the risk of uh, stent thrombosis. So uh, DAPT try is a, a landmark try. In this trial, patients have uh, uh, 12 months uh, DAPT and then randomized to continuous use uh, cyropyridine, uh, including uh, clopidogrel or pasugrel uh, versus placebo. And uh, in this trial published in, in 2014, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, uh, one fourth uh, patient uh, are um, myocardial infarction patient. And the uh, uh, half, uh, near half the land use a uh, uh, second generation uh, drug using stand, and the uh, two two thirds of land uh, received the uh, uh, clopidogrel as the uh, continuous uh, P2F12 inhibitor. And the core primary efficacy endpoint for stand thrombosis, the benefits is there. Uh, use a uh, uh, prolonged uh, your antiplatelet therapy can reduce the uh, risk of stent thrombosis and uh, also reduce the uh, mass rate. Uh, however, uh, there are a borderline significant uh, risk of increase of the uh, uh, deaths. That's the, uh, the risk we should uh, care about. And also in the uh, DAPT trial, uh, add on the second. Uh, Pituitary inhibitor in prolonged use can also reduce the risk of myocardial infarction. I will also uh, increase the risk of breathing, including uh, gas, uh, gas of breathing, especially for the uh, uh, moderate uh, gas uh, uh, breathing. So, based on the uh, uh, DAPT trial, you can see uh, after uh, 12 months. Right now, we can use the uh, uh, corpidogrel and the uh, pasugrel for uh, long-term uh, antiplatelet therapy. But for the uh, ticacquel, that's based on uh, the Pegasus trial. As Professor uh, Bonaka uh, said, uh, a Pegasus trial in low uh, patients suffer from uh, acute myocardial infarction after one, two, three years. Uh, the diff uh, two different uh, uh dose uh, are used in this trial. Uh, finally, uh, only a uh, ticacquel six milligram BID uh, get the approval. Those patient, uh, uh, those uh, patient uh, should have uh, some additional risk factor, including uh, CKD, uh, elderly, uh, prior prior myocardial infarction, multi vessel disease, or diabetes. For those high risk post MI. Uh, patient uh, add on uh, 60 uh, milligram uh, ticacquel can provide a mass reduction and also reduce the risk of further uh, STEMI. But also uh, should pay uh, some uh, uh, breathing, including the uh, TME major breathing and the uh, minor breathing. In the subgroup analysis, uh, however, for uh, for the overall uh, subgroup. Uh, uh, Analysis we can find uh, multi vessel disease, diabetes, uh, renal dysfunction, uh, second second prior, prior myocardial infarction or age. All the subgroup uh, uh, show the consistent data. So for this, uh, for all the high risk population, CACRA 6 milligram can provide a consistent uh, benefit uh, for at least high risk post MI patient. And uh, in the uh, 2019, uh, EAC guideline um, changed the uh, definition of so-called uh, angina 
Right now, we don't use the uh, stable uh, engine, st stable uh, CAD. We use the chronic coronary syndrome because those kind of patients is not stable. The PREG is vulnerable to uh, rupture, especially for those uh, uh, non-copper lesion. As the Professor Bonaka says, uh, atherosclerosis is a, a, a systemic inflammation disease. Uh, after we uh, treat the copper lesion, we should, we should have a medication to uh, take care of the, the other uh, vulnerable plague. In the, the 2019 uh, guideline, uh, after uh, 12 months, there are some uh, different suggestions. First, uh, we will focus on the uh, risk of bleeding. So first, for those is very high risk bleeding. Uh, you can see after one month, uh, EAPT, the chloroquine only strategy is uh, recommended. As a focus on a uh, patient with a recent bleeding episode in past months and the plan not different for the surgery in the near future. So for those kind of high, a very high risk population, uh, one month uh, DAPT and therefore change shift to uh, chloroquine wheel only. And for high risk population, uh, the guideline suggests uh, three months uh, DAPT and after three months use aspirin only. So uh, after three months for very high risk patient, we, we can use uh, uh, crocodile only. Most of the evidence from the Capra trial. Uh, Capra trial in no patient have uh, established uh, cardiovascular disease and the my patient to crocodile only and the aspirin. And in this study, you can see crocodile uh, uh, stretch is not uh, uh, not inferior to uh, aspirin, but provide the borderline uh, better uh, benefit uh, than uh, aspirin. And especially for those uh, outcome uh, of uh, myocardial infarction. And uh, also uh, reduce the, the risk of breathing, including uh, GI breathing and uh, hospitalization for GI breathing event in patients receive a copido queer. In a recent uh, study uh, conducted in the uh, Korea, the host uh, exam study and the host uh, extended study, for those patients uh, with a chronic coronary syndrome and they receive PCI, you can see uh, from the initial trial and the post uh, extension trial, the overall uh, use of uh, corporate only provide a better uh, net clinical benefit for uh, CCS patient not only in uh, initial uh, two years try and also uh, extend the benefit into the extension period. And uh, some body uh, complication also lower and uh, any breathing also lower. And the mortality is not a uh, difference uh, in the uh, post exam and the extended uh, study. And no significant in interaction uh, between the different subgroup analysis. So based on the uh, host exam and the host extended study, uh, for those with uh, uh, patient received uh, uh, PCI, CCS uh, patient, a uh, corporate monotherapy can provide uh, not only the better outcome and also uh, less uh, breathing event. So for the very high risk uh, population after uh, uh, one month uh, DAPT, we can try to use uh, uh, the corporate monotherapy. And for a very high risk uh, breeding population, uh, the guideline use the definition uh, of a precise DAPT score more than 25 or ARC high breeding score criteria meet. Uh, this is a, a summary table for the provides DAPT score. For those with a score higher than uh, 25, is defined as a high risk population. And also the similar slide show also by uh, Professor Bolanka. Uh, if patient meet the uh, ARC high breeding uh, risk uh, population, uh, right now uh, the guideline uh, recommendation only three months, uh, DAPT and after three months, SV only. Uh, the guideline cite uh, one paper uh, just published in uh, European Heart Journal 2017. Uh, you can see um, 
compared with uh, six months uh, DAPT and uh, 12 months DAPT for MI and the stem thrombosis in this uh, uh, high risk population, the uh, uh, event is uh, uh, similar and uh, the breeding risk is also similar. So, so for the high breeding risk population, after three months, uh, uh, DAPT, uh, long-term SP only uh, is recommended from the 2019 ESC uh, guideline. And if patient is a uh, low breeding risk, right now we can uh, try to use a uh, mono uh, decagrial therapy after uh, 12 months. That's uh, from the uh, twilight study. A twilight study in low patient with a high ischemia uh, risk and uh, uh, a low uh, high risk uh, character, including some clinical uh, criteria and uh, some uh, angiography anatomy criteria. After three months DAPT, the patient was randomized to continuous 12 months uh, decagrial or uh, uh, plus aspirin or Ticagrel uh, only. And uh, in this uh, study, after 12 months, uh, some patient uh, continues to reduce, uh, receive the DAPT and uh, uh, some patient uh, receive Ticagrel uh, uh, monotherapy only. And in, in this study, the primary endpoint show uh, the escalation to uh, Ticagrel uh, monotherapy and reduce the breathing and uh, uh, also the uh, similar uh, uh, mass rate. And uh, when we uh, uh, look at the subgroup, subgroup analysis and focus on uh, ACS patient, uh, you can see uh, the benefit is the similar and uh, uh, for those uh, high ischemia ACS patient is uh, reasonable and uh, uh, acceptable to uh, the escalation to uh, Ticagrel uh, monotherapy for those uh, ACS uh, population. So the twilight study, twilight study show the uh, uh, reasonable and uh, possible to take escalation to uh, monotherapy Ticagrel after 12 months uh, ACS uh, population. And, and in the uh, subsequent uh, high risk population analysis, including uh, the other uh, a subgroup analysis, uh, such as a uh, so-called high complex uh, PCI patient. Uh, the definition is here. You can see also the escalation uh, reduce the risk of breathing and not uh, increase the risk uh, of uh, mass rain. And also for the uh, CKD uh, subgroup analysis, you can also see uh, the escalation uh, in a twilight study for the CKT population. Also the breathing rate uh, reduced and the not increase the uh, increased event. And also for the elderly population subgroup, you can see for those with uh, higher than 65 uh, years old, uh, the escalation also reduced the uh, risk of breathing and the not increase the risk of mass rate. And uh, also uh, for the ARC high breathing risk subgroup, as I said before, uh, lots of patients have uh, has, uh, was definitely uh, defined as a, a high risk uh, a population, and also for those uh, high risk population, uh, the escalation also reduced the uh, breathing risk, and also did not increase the mass rate. So, uh, based on a different uh, high risk population analysis, uh, for those uh, uh, with a high ischemia population, the twilight. A study show after uh, 12 months uh, uh, post myocardial infarction, we can use a uh, moral therapy uh, for those kind of patients. So that's why you can see in the 2019 uh, guideline recommendation after 12 months, uh, we can use the uh, uh, only uh, therapy for those with a uh, low breathing risk and a high ischemia risk. And the furthermore, in the left hand side, you can see uh, some recommendation. Uh, the uh, 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 suggestion is from a complex try. A complex try uh, compared with the aspirin and the uh, aspirin uh, plus uh, rivaroxaban, and uh, it include uh, PAD and the CAD patient. And uh, some of them uh, have suffered from uh, 
uh, prior myocardial infarction. And the prime endpoint is uh, 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 triple mass and uh, the safety outcomes modify STH major breeding. And you can see two or third of them uh, have uh, myocardial infarction history. And uh, I think uh, all of you have known that uh, combined with uh, low dose rivastatin 2.5 milligram BID uh, can uh, provide a better uh, outcome uh, compared with the aspirin standard uh, treatment. Uh, it also reduces the risk of uh, cardiovascular death and uh, stroke. When we uh, look at the, the uh, M uh, myocardial infarction uh, subgroup, uh, you can see, uh, whatever, uh, however, uh, the duration of uh, myocardial infarction uh, less than uh, two years or more than five years, the data is uh, consistent. So, so for those with uh, uh, high ischemia risk, uh, post MI, a uh, one year patient, uh, Rubras can, can provide an alternative choice uh, uh, for those uh, high risk population. But, uh, you should know that uh, not all the patients uh, in the complex trial uh, is a uh, myocardial infarction uh, patient. So based on the uh, above mentioned uh, trial in the uh, 2019 EACC skyline suggests uh, uh, 2A A, uh, uh, suggestion for the high thrombotic risk population. For the moderate, uh, ischemia risk population, uh, they suggest uh, to be a indication to add either uh, Ticagrel or Rivaroxaban uh, for those kind of patients. And they have shown the uh, uh, definition for the so-called high thrombotic risk. You should include the complex CAD and at least one below criteria. And the so-called uh, moderate thrombotic risk is non-complex uh, CAD includes uh, at least one uh, criteria. For the left-hand side, a uh, patient is 2A a indication to add the second uh, anti body agent. Uh, for the right-hand side population, uh, the guideline suggests a uh, uh, 2BA indication to add uh, the second anti body agent. And also, uh, we should uh, patient uh, tailor to uh, use a uh, second antithrombotic agent. Uh, for uh, high breeding uh, risk population, uh, we should more uh, conservative. However, based on the uh, evidence, you can also uh, add uh, uh, Dicagrea and the Pashugrea for those kind of patient. For uh, low uh, breeding risk patient, I think we can more aggressive uh, to add the uh, anti thrombotic agent, uh, especially for high ischemia uh, risk population, extend uh, DAPT uh, duration is a, a good choice for those kind of patient. So let's uh, back to the 2023 uh, TSOC guideline. So uh, after uh, uh, 12 months uh, DAPT, uh, we should uh, restratify a uh, patient. If the patient is a high breathing risk, uh, those patients was excluded from the Pegasus and the uh, compass trial. So single antiplatelet agent uh, is recommended. Uh, based on the uh, uh, post exam study, maybe Corpitoquia is a uh, is an alternative choice uh, to aspirin. If the patient is a low breathing risk and the low ischemia risk. Maybe single antiplatelet is enough, but for those uh, is a low breathing risk and a high ischemia risk, such as a uh, polyvascular disease, uh, multivascular disease, heart failure, diabetes, or CKD, we can continue to use a uh, DAPT, uh, such as a uh, Ticagrel, uh, six milligram, or we can shift to the uh, dual uh, pathway inhibitor, uh, such as rivastatin. Uh, 2.5 milligram BID. And uh, yeah, in our guideline, we also uh, definitely the so-called high-risk uh, population and the uh, so-called high breathing risk. Your patient is uh, uh, have the high risk uh, ischemia character, such as uh, you say long stand, uh, multiple stand, or uh, other uh, anatomic 
corrector and uh, a patient related corrector such as uh, PAD, uh, ischemia stroke, multiple vessel disease, heart failure, diabetes, and CKD. Those patients may be a uh, benefit uh, for the uh, second second anti-thrombotic agent. If patient with high breathing risk, uh, such as uh, low body weight, uh, end stage renal disease, uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, uh, need long term use anticoagulation. Uh, liver disease, active malignancy, and uh, uh, history of prior major bleeding. I think we we can uh, consider use a single plate only instead of uh, add, adding uh, the second antisomatic agent. So uh, for the uh, 2023 uh, guideline from uh, Taiwan Society of Cardiology, we uh, recommendation three. Uh, for three criteria for uh, CCS patient. The first one is 1A recommendation. Uh, lifelong aspirin uh, is recommended unless uh, contraindicated. And the second, in patient with prior MI uh, who are at the low breathing and the high body risk, extended DAPT with Kagura, uh 60 uh, milligram BID daily in addition to aspirin for uh, those uh, uh, between the 12 months and the uh, uh, 33 months is 2AB recommendation. And the, uh, for the 2BB recommendation, we can add a rebrazaban 2.5 uh, twice per day to aspirin. Also for the uh, high risk uh, population with uh, low breathing risk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for Professor Lin's excellent and uh, comprehensive talk. And uh, the Q&A and discussion will be held next uh, by Professor Chun Yao Huang and uh, Feng Yu Guo. And so Professor Guo and Professor Huang, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor Wang. And uh, uh, it's, it's my honor to, uh, here with the Dr. Guo, uh, Professor Guo to, to have these sessions, but I, I also have all of us to join together for for the discussions in the first session, we have Professor Bonaka very in detail and informative and very structured, I think, uh, uh, suggestions for us how to uh, choose the patients uh, who are uh, more benefit for uh, prolonged or uh, short depth uh, therapies. And the second, the Dr. Lin uh, provides us the, uh, the, the messages from Taiwan, our uh, local uh, informations. Uh, I think there should be some between the Western and the uh, uh, data in Taiwan. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, if there is no questions, uh, I would like to, to, to ask some, because uh, in our uh, Taiwan society recommendations that we say that in the first line, the aspirin, uh, if no contraindications should be used as a single one. And, uh, but you know that growing evidence showing that probably, uh, but for us more by own uh, practice, Practice probably, probably previously I would uh, aspirin because much of uh, gel bleeding in Asian populations and we used the uh, uh, Provix and later on we have more evidence on the Ticagrio. So, what about your opinion about that? Uh, which one would would you uh, use as a single uh, antiplatelet therapy later on? If, if but of course if, if the if patient is a high ischemic risk, uh, probably they should use the dual. So, uh, I, may I ask your opinions? Uh, just uh, uh, the question for me or, or for Professor uh, Bonanza? Because, both, because this is some uh, differences, uh, opinions about that. Uh, so our society suggests uh, probably aspirin should be used first in class one indication. But from uh, Professor Bonanza's uh, slides and uh, current status, probably uh, later on, uh, 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 even without contraindications, uh, and uh, probably Ticagrio can be used as the only therapy. It, yeah, I'll just comment. I, I mean, I think that um, it's very clear to me that an, a, a, at least one antiplatelet therapy is required. And I think that is also a lesson from the COMPASS trial, where despite the use of a higher dose of rivaroxaban in the monotherapy arm, that was not shown to be efficacious, that, that it had to be added to aspirin 
to be beneficial for patients with coronary disease. So I think I think at least one antiplatelet is needed. And I think aspirin is you have used for a long time. It's inexpensive. I do think it's effective. Nonetheless, I, I, I do think that at least um, in my own practice and, and what I've seen locally is that we've gravitated towards P2Y12 monotherapy in patients that are going to be on a single antiplatelet because P2Y12 inhibition appears to be very effective for coronary prevention, and it appears to be better tolerated than aspirin, particularly for the GI bleeding risk. So, um, you know, I think the recommendation and the guideline is very reasonable, but but I will say that uh, that the data uh, supporting P2Y12 monotherapy continues to to be strong and stronger, and and I I do utilize that quite quite often in my higher bleeding risk patients, and it's a nice option for de-escalation, um, you know, as people get further away from their MI or become higher bleeding risk. But I'm interested in hearing from others as well. Yes, I think I, I have a similar opinion with Professor Bonaka and the, the similar experience uh, from uh, uh, Professor Huang in Taiwan. Uh, uh, some patient, especially uh, elderly population, uh, more easy to suffer from uh, GI bleeding. However, in the uh, Taiwan, uh, Insurance reimbursement uh, for those with a uh, high breeding risk population, such as elderly population. Right now, we can uh, use clopidogrel instead of uh, aspirin for those kind of patient. So I think for those uh, high risk population, and uh, based on the uh, our experience and uh, based on the reimbursement and the recent evidence based, such as uh, uh, I show in the host exam and the host exam extension study, I think clopidogrel is a, a reasonable and more safe uh, agent for the ASCA patient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I have a question about the uh, post uh, exam trial uh, regarding the uh, data published uh, conduct in, conducted in Korea? We know that we have a East Asia products, which accounts maybe for uh, health uh, less than 50% in Asia population, either uh, poor responder and uh, non responder. But from the post exam trial, we can see that the even the event rate was uh, even around 11 or 12 percent in uh, such kind of patient, scar patient. So, uh, regarding the uh, gene polymorphism issue and uh, the clinical uh, outcome, it seems that the if we use a monotherapy with P2Y12 inhibitor as clopidogrel, growth, it seems that the event rate was not so high. Uh, is there any discussion? frequency between the genetic uh, abnormality and uh, the clinical effect. Actually, I mean, I wonder if the patient, even with a uh, uh, growth non-responder and he used only monotherapy with corpidal growth. Reason, uh, theoretically speaking, it might have event in the future, but in our data press or in clinical data, that seems not so high. Uh, mass events in such kind of patients. I will request uh, two master's opinion about this. Thanks. Okay, uh, let me first uh, answer the question. Uh, I uh, will invite uh, Bonaka to have some uh, suggestion. Uh, mm -hmm. If you uh, see the uh, host uh, uh, exam study, uh, the patient is a uh, uh, patient uh, received the PCI and after uh, one year. That is, uh, the, the patient may have uh, uh, passed the uh, safe uh, one year's uh, DAPD therapy, uh, including use of clopidogrel. So for those kind of patients, maybe use uh, extend uh, clopidogrel is uh, relatively safe. Then those uh, patients suffer from acute coronary syndrome use uh, clopidogrel in the initial uh, DAPD therapy. So I think it's a, a reason why we can uh, still see uh, the uh, benefit of clopidogrel, especially for the CCS patient, not for the ACS patient. Uh, we know the uh, Asian population are concerned about the uh, clopidogrel resistance uh, in our population. However, some uh, paper discussing the aspirin resistance uh, also in the uh, ASCA patient. So I think uh, the most uh, critical uh, issue uh, why the uh, host exam uh, Study show cons consistent uh, uh, beneficial effect of clopidogrel uh, than the aspirin. I think that's because uh, most of patient has uh, safely passed the two month, uh, twelve months uh, DAPD therapy. That's that's my opinion. Uh, uh, Professor Bonaka, please. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, you know, I think it was a selected population who tolerated clopidogrel for 12 months. And so, you know, if the people who had a recurrent event or had an MI within that period wouldn't have been eligible. And I think that that's quite pragmatic for the clinic. If you have a patient who comes in, who's been doing well on clopidogrel, continuing clopidogrel is probably reasonable. They've kind of declared themselves as somebody who, who is, is doing well on that. You know, it, it, it's harder when somebody's post ACS and you don't know, you know, that, that really speaks to the Plato trial where I think there is a benefit for a more potent, less variable agent. But I think that if you interpret um, the trial in the context of, of those who had tolerated it for 12 months, just as was said, um, then I think that's a reasonable strategy to continue. Yes, and I would like to, to ask about uh, things uh, we know that uh, probably some <laughs> study conducted by the stand companies or something, uh, some uh, uh, encourage the short depth with high bleed. But in, in, in the guidelines, we, uh, there are also some suggestions. But as we know that we don't really have to follow that, we uh, probably some people just keep using that. So I, I'm wondering that, uh, I, uh, Professor Bonaka, what's your uh, real uh, daily practice? Uh, when encounter a patient with high bleeding risk, probably we will uh, probably think uh, 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 to stop uh, according to the guideline, just uh, three months or one month step. But what about your current opinion about that? And do you uh, even have the experience to extend to use for more than one year later on, even with this kind of patient have been classified as high bleeding risk? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I do follow the guidelines. I, I think that although many patients who are at high bleeding risk are also at high ischemic risk, that overall the benefit of, of a long-term more potent strategy doesn't benefit them because eventually if they have a bleeding event, they, they stop everything. And, and then that also puts them at higher risk. You know, when we looked at the Pegasus trial, those patients, you know, they're, they're patients that couldn't get into Pegasus if they had cirrhosis or some of the high bleeding risk factors that you outlined in the guidelines there, you know, they wouldn't have gotten into the trial. Even for those that did, um, there were some patients that were high bleeding risk. They'd had anemia or prior history of bleeding. And what we saw is they had a very high event rate for ischemic events, but they didn't benefit from long-term DAPT because they, they had so many tolerability or bleeding issues. So I, I do follow the guidelines for those patients and, and try to de-escalate. You know, I, I will point out that, that that was about a fifth of the patients in the trial. And so I don't think that um, that's the majority of patients, but we really have to personalize for those high bleeding risk patients. I see. The, so, the, so it means that even the patients during the three uh, months uh, 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 treatment without any evidence of bleed. So you will just stop that according to the guides, right? It, it is. Yeah, I, I would follow the guidelines. Although I think that if they've tolerated for three months, I would personalize. And I, I often have a conversation with the patient and their family to understand the sort of trade-off of bleeding and ischemic risk. It, it's not as straightforward as the de-escalation studies sometimes in the clinic, but, but I generally follow the guidelines. I see, thanks. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Bonaka, yes, uh, I, may I ask you one question? In patients uh, require anticoagulation as they suffer acute myocardial infarction, we need to shorten the period of triple therapy, maybe one week or one month after procedure. And thereafter, we could choose uh, anticoagulation with one uh, antiplatelet therapy, maybe aspirin or p 2 y inhibitor. And in your diet practice, during the uh, first week or first month, as we using the dual therapy, you will choose uh, P2Y2 inhibitor or aspirin combined with uh, anticoagulation therapy. Thank you. That's a great question. Something we always grapple with. I was just in the CCU recently, and you know, you have you know large MI with LV thrombus, or they may have another reason for anticoagulation, like atrial fibrillation. You know, we I generally will. Um, you know, start triple therapy with aspirin, a P2I12 inhibitor, and, and the full dose anticoagulant. I try to drop aspirin quite quickly, uh, usually within a week. Um, you know, it, it's possible I'd go longer if you know, there were an anatomic consideration, but usually 
a week or so and, and then, you know, maintain them on P2Y12 inhibition and anticoagulation. You know, what which agents you choose is is sometimes complex and it depends on the situation. I, I generally prefer the direct oral anticoagulants to warfarin because there's about a 50% reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. But if they have you know, mechanical valve or something, you, you have to use warfarin. And for the P2Y12, you know, most of the folks around here will, will favor clopidogrel with the notion that it's less potent. So, you know, clopidogrel and anticoagulant, I, I actually have used decagrel or 60 milligrams off, off label because it's for ACS and, and had good uh, experience with that as well. Yeah, thank you. Yes, and about uh, the duration, uh, the, the how long we should use that. Uh, some of the audience from online, uh, they uh, ask about some questions. And since I think uh, Professor Monaga have shown that the Nepexa study with a three year uh, uh, follow up, the first year, second year, and third year, it seems that the third year, the benefit from the Ticagrio have not been lessened. But how long you think you, you will use in daily practice? Yeah, it, it's a great question. Um, you know, no trial can go on forever, even for our statin trials. You know, they may last uh, five years. The PCSK9 trials were about two and a half years, but yet we, you know, we extrapolate long-term benefit and we can tend to continue them. You know, for DAPT um, in Pegasus, you know, remember that the patients were about two years from their most recent MI, 1.7 years, and they entered the trial. And so even in that that third year of the trial, about a quarter of them were almost seven years from the most recent MI, and they had the same risk and the same benefit. So my take on all of that is that, you know, these post-MI patients don't, don't become lower risk over time. Actually, they, they maintain the risk or may become higher risk, and I that, therefore want to do everything I can to reduce that risk. That being said, we all change over time and their bleeding risk may change. And so, you know, I see them every six months and even after year three or four or five, if, if they develop an issue that puts them a higher risk of bleeding, I might drop the aspirin. Um, I think that's very reasonable to do, but otherwise I, I don't deescalate with the notion that they are lower ischemic risk because they really are long-term high risk patients. Yes. Professor Awa, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, Professor Polanka, thanks so much for the uh, excellent talk. Uh, I have a question of, uh, about the, the pre hospital TAPT used in America, maybe for adults. In, in, in Taiwan, some of the uh, city, uh, in Hoji Gaoshan City, we will uh, use uh, the hospital aspirin and the Tiger Girl 90 milligram under the instruction, online instruction of the uh, emergency doctor. Uh, because we don't have a doctor on the ambulance, we only have a, a paramedical on the ambulance. So how about uh, in Colorado, in America, would you prescribe the pre-hospital uh, DAPT uh, in, uh, in, in the ambulance? Thank you so much. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and, and you know, I do think that there, um, you know, there is an opportunity to improve outcomes by early, you know, having earlier interventions like antithrombotic therapy and others in the ambulance and so on. I mean, infarct sives is still the determinant of subsequent heart failure mortality. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there, but our system doesn't really enable pre-hospital pre administration of P2Y12 routinely. Um, you know, patients are brought in as quickly as possible and, and they may be administered DAPT in the emergency room. Um, there are patients, you know, they're going to go right to the cath lab or even for non-ST elevation MI where the, the time between their presentation and the cath lab is short, um, in which case we generally don't even preload. We, we will wait for the, for the cath. I think for the patient that may, um, you know, sit for 48 hours or something like that, there may be an opportunity to preload, but we don't, we don't pre-administer in the ambulance. Uh, we may in the emergency room, but often we wait for the cath lab. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Professor Bonaka. And uh, first of all, thank you for your excellent talk. And uh, according to your slide about the landmark analysis in plateau studies, uh, we can see that after one year of depth with uh, aspirin and Tychogler, uh, Tychogler still showed a consistent benefit uh, over the clopidogrel after one year, uh, one month of depth. Uh, however, according to another important uh, clinical trial, 
the Carlos MI the Carlos MI study, uh, which showed that after one month of depth, um, the a uh, clopidogrel, uh, when we de-escalate the ticagrel into the clopidogrel, uh, the bleeding event can be reduced in this way. So how do you interpret pre 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 uh, the difference between these two trials? And uh, will you uh, buy in the uh, strategy by the Talos AMI study? Thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's a great question. So Plato is a very large trial. Um, you know, it was over 18,000 patients and, you know, there was a benefit for ticagrelor overall, including a mortality benefit, but there was an increase in bleeding and, you know, the, the benefit risk was maintained in the 30 day landmark, meaning, you know, that, that for those patients who hadn't had an event for the first 30 days, um, being in ticagrelor was still better in terms of ischemic risk, worse in terms of bleeding than, than clopidogrel, but still an overall net benefit. And I think that aligns quite well with Talus. I think that you can reduce bleeding by using a, a less potent agent, you know, switching at 30 days. I, I do think there's an ischemic risk to pay and you need a big trial to show that because the the, the event rates are relatively low in you know, that short period of time. Um, but I think both trials are really informative and useful. And what the way I think about it is that, um, you know, for a patient at 30 days, that is, uh, you're concerned about bleeding, you know, there may be some where you want to deescalate, you could deescalate by, you know, moving to clopidogrel, you could deescalate by dropping aspirin, <laughs> that would probably be my favorite approach. At this point, <laughs> um, you could deescalate by moving to, to Kegel or 60, I think that strategy will reduce bleeding. Um, and, and I think of those options, probably moving to clopidogrel would be my least favored, um, but not unreasonable. Uh, and for the patient who's doing well and not a high bleeding risk, I'd still continue both agents uh, beyond a month. But I think it's how we, we personalize these strategies to the patients that we see. I think the, the clinic is always more complicated than the trials. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I want to uh, talk more about, uh, I think that uh, Professor Bonaka in your slide have showed us the beautiful way to have us to clarify which one is more precisely high bleed. Because according to the uh, previous precise breed uh, score and uh, some of the uh, uh, European uh, BARC uh, criteria probably provide some of the information, but not so accurate probably. But in, in your, uh, uh, your presentation showing that in the papers we use the hemoglobin and also the uh, previous uh, GI bleeding uh, history as a go, and it shows the, uh, the, the good one. But, uh, uh, but what, uh, in addition to that, I think uh, we still, like you say, that we have liver, a patient with liver cirrhosis and uh, very old patients with over 90 uh, year old, uh, in, especially in Asia. So what do you think about that? Do you will take into consideration uh, only about the hemoglobin or GI bleeding or you will also consider them? And how do you uh, incorporate so, so many information together to make a decision? Which one is the real high bleeding risk? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And so I think, you know, I would begin with recognizing who was allowed in the trial. And so there were patients with end stage renal disease on dialysis. They weren't eligible to be in Pegasus. Those with cirrhosis, we didn't have many patients over 90 years old or those who um, maybe were frail, both in terms of age, but also in terms of uh, strength and body weight and other features. And so, um, you know, I'd first begin by, by recognizing that there were a population of patients that we would all understand are high bleeding risk and wouldn't have been in, allowed in the trial. That also includes people who were on therapeutic or full dose anticoagulation. For those, I think they are high bleeding risk. That's why they weren't, you know, it, it, it enrolled in the trial. And I think I would, I would sort of put them in that category in terms of decision-making. But for patients that that aren't don't have an obvious bleeding issue, uh, meaning they don't they're not on dialysis, they don't have cirrhosis, they're not 90 years old and frail, you know, there it may you may want to have additional tools to identify high bleeding risk, and those are the patients where I think, you know, a, you know, history of GI bleeding, especially if they didn't have a treatable cause, um, you know, maybe they have. A, um, you know, AVMs or other things that you can't really do much about, um, or if they have a low hemoglobin, you know, in Pegasus, it was fascinating. We looked at all these bleeds and, and uh, you know, for all of them, it, these were people that had polyps 
or other gastrointestinal pathology they didn't know about. Um, they were anemic and then they were put in the trial. And of course the drugs don't make you bleed, but they um, unmask you know, sources of bleeding like these polyps. And so I think anemia is actually quite useful and needs to be investigated. So I, to answer your question, I think that um, you know, there's a broader construct for bleeding risk. I think there are clinical areas where, you know, good clinicians will understand patients wouldn't have been eligible for a trial, their high bleeding risk. If they don't have those, the, these two features I showed, I think are still useful for further risk stratification. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bernaka, uh, sorry to, I, I want to ask the question about in dialysis patient. We know that the, the dialysis patient is easy, easier to get the mass event regarding myocardial infarction or TVR or TLR. But in such kind of patient, um, I would like to invite your opinion regarding the antithrombotic therapy in such kind of patient. Um, in my in my dead practice, I think the uremic patient under, under dialysis is very easy to get with stenosis, which may be related to arterial, scler uh, arterial uh, sclerosis, not atherosclerosis. So, What's your opinion or recommendation on such kind of patient, uh, uh, either ACS or CCS uh, post procedure? Thank you. It's a great, great question. It's really complicated, as you said, and I think it's complicated because the pathobiology of disease in the end stage renal patient, like you said, you know, it, there's a, a real issue with calcification and arterial sclerosis, and, and maybe less atherothrombosis. And you know, many trials um, have excluded these patients. Those that have been courageous and studied this population, you know, even with statins, have not shown benefit. And so, I think it is a, a very complicated population, and I think it's a very high bleeding risk. Um, you know, this this isn't just a problem for acute or, or chronic coronary syndrome, but even in atrial fibrillation, there's a lot of debate on whether you should anticoagulate patients who have. Um, end stage renal disease and what the right agents are. And so I think it's just a difficult issue. We need more data. In terms of practice, though, we have to treat our patients and do the best we can. And so, um, you know, the ACS patient, I think, needs to be treated with DAPT. Um, although I think that I, I generally would de-escalate more rapidly and not not do, use long-term DAPT in those patients. But I do think P2I12 inhibition is, is important. And I would probably continue a twilight type strategy for that kind of patient. You know, for the chronic coronary syndrome, um, then I, I probably would as well. You, you can't use low-dose rivaroxaban despite the benefits and compass in this population. And so, um, you know, I, I, um, I do use the agents and I, I try to de-escalate and P2I12 monotherapy, I think, is a, a promising um, strategy. Yeah, thank you. Yes, is there any questions on board? No, I guess no question, more question on board. So, okay, okay, due to the time strain, I think I have to close the sections and I will move the, the session to uh, Professor Wang. Okay, <clears throat> thank you uh, for uh, Professor uh, Guo and Professor Huang's excellent uh, holding uh, for the discussion sessions. And uh, um, right now I would like to close these sessions today. And uh, uh, today we, we've been very privileged to have a, a Professor uh, Bonaka from uh, and uh, Professor Zhong Xianlin uh, to uh, for the very their very excellent talk, and they have provo uh, provided their provo profound knowledge and experience uh, with us. And uh, I thought that I think that their presentation have offered us uh, new perspectives on the role of new uh, generation P twelve twelve inhibitors. Uh, besides, uh, they, uh, the Professor Lin also provides the, the latest TSOC guidelines in treating the high bleeding risk uh, MI patients. And I'm certain that uh, we are all uh, learning from these sessions with a rich understanding about the pathophysiology and the clinical uh, uti utilities of the adaptive therapies for these kind of patients. And besides, I would also like to extend my deepest uh, great, uh, gratitude to our dedicated panelists and moderators today, uh, whose contributions uh, would uh, have sparked uh, throughout the provoking discussions and brought us the many new insights. And of course, uh, 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 due to uh, everyone's participation, uh, so uh, today our uh, session will be very successful. 
And uh, so I think everyone's uh, joint uh, the attention, uh, the uh, participation would make this, uh, this kind of academic series uh, more successful and consistent in the future. And uh, as we wrap up, uh, let's carry forward the insight and knowledge we gain today into our clinical practice. And uh, I, I believe that uh, the, the knowledge we learned today would uh, have a constant improving uh, to our patient care and towards our uh, upgoing stations. Besides, I'm also excited to announce that um, this, uh, this is only the beginning of our insightful journey uh, today. And we still have two more online meetings uh, in this series scheduled for the August 13th and the sub subsequent date uh, that will be announced later. And I encourage all of you to stay tuned and participate in these upcoming sessions. And moreover, I'm also delighted to share that we will hold in the Thomas Autumn's Academic Congress on September 10th this year at the Kaohsiung's Ve uh, Veterans General Hospital. And furthermore, on February 